And yet I am sat here at Vapor Expo in Birmingham in the NEC in halls 11 and 12. It was going to be 12, but now it's 11 and 12 with Fraser Cropper. Fraser, thanks for coming okay. along to talk to us. Pleasure. Um, we can't go any further before I mention the challenge and uh, the European Court of Justice's despicable treatment of it. What have you got to say about that? Uh, disappointed yet unsurprised is the <laughs> yeah. pithy response, really. Unsurprised because after the hearing late last year, I think it became very clear to me and uh, our legal team that we probably weren't given the thoroughness of a hearing that we probably deserve to have. Mm. And we had the whole of the Commission and the European Parliament railed against us. We had one barrister given 10 minutes and we had seven barristers against us given 70 minutes. So if it's just proportionally how much time you had to speak, we had a 7 to 1 disadvantage. Uh, and for what I saw in the judging, or the judges' questions and the advocates general's questions, it was probably also evident in the positioning implied by those questions that they'd pretty much decided what the outcome would be before they'd heard our case. Now, it may be that I sound prejudiced because, of course, I had a vested interest. Uh, but, not, you know, the legal team was also very disappointed in the manner that our hearing was heard and clearly in the outcome, but not surprised. No, I mean, it, it, the bit that got, got to me was the wording of it was basically because we say so. It was. No science. And no... we found it's proportional and it's necessary. We're applying the precautionary principle, etc. Same old trite nonsense. Yes, it would it just... Not, not at all good. So next steps then with regard to that, are there any further legal steps we can take? Or uh, no, with, not with the EU, I think uh, you know, that's pretty much done and dusted. The problem we have now of course is that whilst the TPD is suggested to have been necessary to bring harmony in European regulation is doing exactly the opposite. There's 28 national interpretations being applied across 28 different schedules. So it's brought total chaos, total disharmony, um, so we are going to struggle, we as a business and every other business, in trying to, in the next six months, to rationalise what that means for our businesses. Well, yeah, because you've got, you've got Germany as We've well, got Germany, we, we sell B2C to all countries in Europe, from the 20th of May, B2C sales are prohibited, unless you've informed the respective national body and have gained authority from the bodies that you wish to sell into the nations of. That makes sense, uh, but we can't do that because the protocols aren't established yet. So we follow the letter of the law. Unilaterally, we will not be able to sell products into Europe after the 19th of May. It's craziness, utter craziness. It is craziness, and, and that plus many, many more impacts, which I don't think were understood. If they were understood, then they showed a lot of pressures to understand what they were doing, how clever they were to have delivered that regulation, bound in nice words, ultimately with a very sinister motive, delivered through a sinister regulation set. So I think we're going to have to find our way. Yes. Find and, our way. And, 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 yeah. How then does IBVTA, which you're a, a, a strong force behind, yeah. how then do they view what's going on? What kind of help is going to be available to their members and, and additional members going forward? Well, the, the IBVTA, I think, is essential to what is going to happen in the UK. Um, the MHRA and the Department of Health, I think, to their credit, have shown a willingness to engage and listen and understand yes. what the practicalities are and try and work with the trade association that they can build a trusting relationship with. I think we've done a great deal in a short period of time to build those confidences. Yeah, yeah. So with those confidences, I'd like to think that the IBBHA can work with the Department of Health and the MHRA to produce, at least in the UK, an exemplar of what you can do with the TPD applying the leniencies and tolerances where you need to, to deliver a sector which is managed and delivered through credible businesses who take their responsibility seriously. Mm. And we do, and I know the rest of the board members do, and the members that we will eventually accrete into the wider associates. Uh, it's a place for good business. Yes. It's a place for, not big business, it's a place for good business. We want as many small vendors to be part of that association because I recognise, as all the rest of the board members recognise, and I think all manufacturers and importers recognise, if vaping is going to succeed in the UK, it's going to succeed because you've got owner-operators running vaping stores. If we don't have vaping stores, we'll leave the door open to a parade of big capitalised tobacco-based companies to yes. dominate through distribution models which 
don't allow for people to have the range of products or the service levels they get through vaping stores. So anybody who suggests that IBBG is a cartel led by that cropper bloke and all the rest of them, totally misunderstand our business model needs small businesses. So if I'm looking at it just parochially, for a TW-centric position, I will be working to try and make sure that every independent vaping store can be facilitated. But the IBBGA also has to be credible, and that means that some people have to change their business models. Yes. Uh, and if you're a vendor, but you're an importer, make your mind up what you want, because if you want to import, then you've got to do what importers need to do. You've got a whole range of responsibilities. And that's the noblesse oblige when it comes to what your business has to do. Mm. If you want to act as an importer, then take the responsibilities. Yes. Uh, and you know, we're going to be the police force for the MHRA, but we'll be the police force for those organisations that want to be part of what the IBVH has done. Well, the, 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 next, the next six months is going to be telling in that, isn't it, of course, because we've kind of got that grace period. Yeah, we have. Um, and over the next six months, it, it makes it... I think a lot easier for small businesses, small outfits to make that decision. Are you going to import? Are you going to be an out and out vendor? Yes. And, and yeah, there's, there's room for people to be both, I, I assume, um, because the next six months give you the chance to get the information together, get the notifications together, get the definitions together. Yes. And manage your range so your range is manageable given the constraints that those financial impacts are going to impose on your business because there's a financial impact for all of us. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I get asked loads and loads of questions. Under the TPD, can we do this? Can we do that? Or how do we go about doing this? And that's great. But what I'm now starting to say is, look, you need to talk to your trade bodies. Whether it's IBVTA, whether it's a C, it doesn't matter who it is, you need to talk to your trade bodies because they're closer to it. I'm more consumer focused. Yes. But I, I, I did want to say, I, I did want to say on behalf of all of the consumers, a big thank you to Totally Wicked for taking the challenge on because it's highlighted the nonsense that is the EU with regard to the TPD yeah, and Article 20. But, and I think, irrespective as to what the outcome was, it has not been wasted. There's been a lot of money spent and it wasn't just a narrow focus of this is what TW has to do for TW. People might well project them as well. They can project whatever they want. Yeah. I know what I was doing before. Yeah. I know what the motives were. Um, but nothing is ever wasted. In this case, nothing has been wasted because at least it has kept that debate connected to something that was moving forward. Mm. It kept it live. It kept it relevant. And it's also allowed for our business and others to use that as a vehicle that continues that debate and continues that force for change. Without that, I think it would be ever more difficult for us to have elevated the matter that we were concerned with throughout those last 24 months. Well, if, if it's done nothing else, the judgment being published over this last few days has at least cemented the ability for me to say, right, you said it wasn't going to happen, not you, but there's a whole load of vapors out there said, ah, it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen. And now we're in a situa situation where it has happened, it's been confirmed, it's going ahead, this isn't any longer a situation where you can bury your head in the sands. And, I, and as I tweeted yesterday, now we fight harder, we fight faster, oh, we fight louder, we fight with greater voices and greater numbers. But it's also shown by that judgment the absolute intransigence of that organisation. Yes. Being lenient on people like the MB Committee in 2013 and passing a judgment which was perhaps they really did not know enough. Mm. Perhaps there wasn't enough information available. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they needed to apply more of that precautionary principle. Well, in 2016, that's not the case. More. There is a, an absolute body of evidence and supporting critique of that evidence by bodies which are authoritative and credible that state vaping is a force for change. Vaping is positive, the TPD is not fit for purpose in the context of what these products can deliver. Exactly right. The judges had an opportunity to invest into that pot of awareness, to look back 24 months and compare whether the future state, the current state and beyond, allowed them to pass a dis different judgment and a different risk assessment than was applied in 2013. They chose not to. Yes. So with that, I think we can all take a simple conclusion, which is the EU is not returning. I've used Margaret Thatcher's quotes twice, though. <laughs> the first one I've referenced, the first one I didn't reference, the second one I did. Yeah. Um, but the EU is definitely not returning. No. So well, there is no point playing directly into that organisation. I think. Because you won't listen. I think 
as you said earlier before we came on camera, I think we've got to work on the UK. It is. I think we've got to make the UK the exemplar of what regulation for e-cigs can be. Yeah. And my feeling is, in my dealings with MHRA and DOH, I think it goes yours. I think they're actually willing to do that. I think so as well. They're just looking for the loopholes that will allow them to do that. I think they are as well. And uh, you know, I'm not going to make any comment on Brexit. Uh, personally, off camera, I would, but not on behalf of the business. It's not my position to make comments politically about whether we should stay or whether we should go. But we do have an opportunity nationally, given, as you mentioned, the willingness to partake in proper constructive discussion, to learn from what's going to happen in the next six months, to create in the UK. A, an environment which is sufficiently permissive but also constrained by the necessary parts of the regulation yes. to give customers a confidence that they should engage in vaping. One thing that hasn't happened in the past two years is customers have not been encouraged to vape. No. Why? Because firstly the mood music has not been encouraging and secondly if you want those people to encourage use they've also got to be confident that the sector that's delivering it is competent and responsible enough. Yes. So we have to allow a little bit of this TPD to form to show that the sector can take responsibility, is willing to do that. Once we've done that, I think we have an opportunity to connect those two together. We can connect those people who want vaping to be successful because they recognise generically how good it can be with an industry that is willing to take those responsibilities has proven demonstrably that it will take forward the things which are important. Testing our fluids, openness to our customers and what we're trying to sell to them not selling products that we know are patently dangerous, taking responsibility for those things that we know we should not be importing because we would have used them ourselves. Yes. We can prove that. We can then connect together those acolytes waiting in the wings. Then we have a chance in the UK to really dominate the vaping market, i.e. not TW, not the IBBTA, but vaping to dominate that market, yes. to transform the UK market to a place where people who hitherto have not considered vaping, now will consider vaping. Yes. When they start to vape, they'll stay with vaping. They'll be more and more acolyte-like to people who are still smoking. We can allow for the UK to become a place which is a little island, an oasis, where Europeans can look into the UK and see our smoking rates plummeting. They can see our impact upon health increasing. They can connect that into... That's because they've got a sense of a regulation set. Well, Stanton Glantz said, uh, only this last week, that the UK is now part of the biggest experiment there's ever been. And I think we stand a very good chance of actually demonstrating the Stanton Glance as a result of this experiment that if the UK gets it right, and I think we can get it right, yeah. that this will show that vaping is the way forward. By choice, not by coercion, not by anything nasty coming from on high, but purely and simply by choice, we can show how vaping can be a positive step forward for the rest of the world. Good and right. I really look forward to that happening. Good one, I think you will. The, uh, you know, I, I often reflect to my brother on this stuff, this sort of Damocles has been hanging over the sector ever since we formed TW in 2008. It's never going to fall. No. That sword will never fall, it just changes. It just moves along the temporal line. Yes. It won't fall, it can't fall because this vaping product set is too important and there's too many people who get it. Yes. There's too many people who get it. Talking about people who get it and people that don't, totally it does have an American operation, doesn't it? Yeah. And of course the deeming regs have just been uh, announced. Are you up to speed with those? Uh, as much as you can with, a, with an 80-page document that was delivered to me yesterday afternoon. Yeah, which uh, basically it's... wipes out 99% of the market over yeah, there. Yeah, so uh, in its current form, if that is passed, a business of our size in the USA will have to close our business. Okay. No hyperbole, it will be impossible. Why? Because it makes it pretty much impossible to sell hardware, mm. apart from legacy hardware. Um, it causes everything to be stiltified in 2016, 2017, 2018. Post-2018, if it came into force, nobody would be able to afford to bring products to bear unless you had significant distribution and you had enormous capital investment to invest in that product and its subsequent marketing and its subsequent distribution. Businesses like ours, of which in America our businesses are, businesses like TW are the business models. Small to medium businesses, 10 or 15 stores owned, small e-commerce businesses, selling a large range to be competitive. Those businesses legally will not be sustainable in the USA. Uh, E-Juice, uh, uh, e 
yes, if you've got a stable range and a small enough range, once again, it plays into large capitalised companies such as tobacco companies who can produce a range of 10, get them all qualified and tested, get them distributed and manage all those costs that are going to be incurred and the significant costs. Small businesses, I don't know where they go. Well, I was hearing figures of $330,000 per, per product, per, product, yeah. per skew. Uh, which is ridiculous. Well, let's assume that's inflated by 10 times. It's still ridiculous at 30k. Yeah. And it's, it's unbearable at 30k. Well, the, the way I see it, I think that while, for a while, we thought that we would need to buy juices in from the US in order to avoid draconian TPD regulation, it looks as though it's going to go the other way. Yeah. And the Americans are going to have to buy from us yeah. in the UK because the UK has been as permissive as it has, which is the strangest state of affairs. It is. I could ever imagine. But, I'd always seen it being the other way. But I can't believe it will not be contested. Uh, the problem we have in America, of course, I say of course, it's not of course. My hypothesis about what we see in America is that I don't think there are businesses of the size that they would need to be to fight this in the USA legal system. I think it's such a drain on they're gonna have capital. To, they're going to have to group together to fight this. Well, they're going to have to. That'd be quite difficult to do. E-liquid companies potentially, so I think e-liquid would be secured, albeit it will be a significantly different business model and yeah. a different sector post the implementation of what the FDA wants to impose. Hardware, you haven't got that, that critical mass in hardware in the USA. No. So if you've got e-liquid able to be continued to be sold through distribution channels which are sustainable, without the hardware, you know, vaping is going to be unsuccessful. Mm because the two need to be hand in glove together. So whilst you may well enable continued e-liquid sales of a certain variety and a certain quality, without the vaping products, you're not going to engage the people that you need to engage to sell the fluid and build the vapor's knowledge base and the vapor's confidence and the vapor's product satisfaction. So, And even, even that only is going to account for current vapors. It's not going to account for new people. I agree, yeah. I agree. Which is just crazy. And, and, and once again, you ask yourself the question, why? What's the intent? What's the end state? Well, you have to conclude that, don't you, really? There's no other conclusion. It's all about the money. The it's lobbying, never about health. The lobbying has been really successful. Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't want to end on a dumb note. I don't want to end on a down note. I still think the UK is going to be optimistic, don't you? Yeah. What well, you see here today, Dave, there's, this is a, a sector which in three years has become this yeah. in the UK. If this was held in 2012, it would have been in a, a side part of this. It would have been a shed. It would have been a shed. There would have been 20, 30 different suppliers with makeshift displays, selling stuff that they'd literally made in their house. We've yeah. got significant businesses here, lots of investments. Yes, they've all got, it's, it's huge. They've all got ambitions and they all want this sector to be successful. So I think that in of itself is positive. Yes. It's positive that we live here in the UK where wherever best we can and where we have the chance to sense does seem to prevail yes uh, and I think the UK vaping market both customers and the companies that service those customers I think it is a couple that we can be really proud of yeah so I think we are taking the position and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what we're doing with, with TW I'm proud of what RBVGA stands for and is trying to achieve uh, ultimately because it's going to further that and take the UK to a position which as you mentioned, should be an example and I think will be. Yes, indeed. Well, okay, then. thank you very much, Fraser Cropper. Thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing how things go moving forward. Thanks, sir. Great.